hit a G3 XE here. I have not posted a video in a while. That was Lucy the dog. But um, uh, yeah, I've actually moved and then just things got in the way or whatever. But I want to start posting some videos and today I'm going to be talking about um, my new Dungeons and Dragons campaign. And it is um, dubbed Adventures in the Far Lands. Um, so the Far Lands, I got my uh, handy dandy 8x11 printer paper map. Um, with Crayola marker, and then also you can see this is just like a uh, uh, binder sleeve or whatever. I had it from extra school project stuff, and it's um, it's nice. I just drew a hex pattern on it, um, and you can do that with a regular you know square pattern as well. Take any map you have, slip it in the back here, and boom! Now you can do travel um, easily, counting travel or random encounters, biomes, stuff like that. Um, so that's a neat little trick, but uh, uh, I just want to talk about the Far Lands and give an update on so far what's happened. So um, the Far Lands can exist in any um, pre-established campaign world. This world is called the Land of Gree, uh, G-R-E-E, -E. and you see uh, Gree um, has not expanded into the entirety of the continent, uh, the, the, you know, the... The kingdom um, has its limits, and then, of course, the wilderness are on the edges. But between wilderness and the kingdom proper lie the far lands, the wild, wild west where um, there's not really law, but not really um, anarchy, where might often makes right, but there are vestiges of civilization. One of that um, vestige of civilization is the town of Buflubton. Yes, Buflubton um, lies on the Lonely Lake um, and is pretty much the biggest settlement in this area, um, especially the biggest friendly settlement. Um, so what do we have um, in the Farlands? Let me just go all around. So, uh, and with some ideas about like what quests might be there. Uh, Mount Morthgar. The big mountain. You can see that from the top of the mountain, two rivers um, uh, kind of trail off, and um, one of which goes down and forms the Lonely Lake and then goes over to the Corsair coast. The other um, heads on over across and over to Castle Krakenguard. And if you use uh, Old Spice deodorant, you'll know that I stole Krakenguard as a name from one of their brands, but whatever. It's a cool name and I'm taking it. Um, Mount Morthgar, I think, is going to be Orcs, uh, central, and Morthgar is literally the, like, chieftain orc. Um, then you can see over here to the side, we have the Morthgari Moors. Uh, maybe, like, more orcs, but also, like, swamp orcs, and they have, like, a thing going with the hobgoblins or something. Um, the Drowsy Forest, yes, the Drowsy Forest, and this is spoilers, so no players can watch this who are playing in my campaign. Um... But obviously, this is for DMs to uh, build on, if they would like. Uh, the Drowsy Forest is a forest that, um, as you walk through it, uh, and those of you who are not uh, either wood elves or purely aligned with the forest, i.e. druids, um, you begin to get sleepier and sleepier. You eventually just like can't control yourself, fall down and sleep, and you sleep forever, uh, turning slowly into a tree. So as people walk through the Drowsy Forest, who are those two groups I listed above, um, they'll actually start to encounter trees that are shaped like people. And these are previous adventurers who have wandered into the Drowsy Forest and died. Um, Shazad's tower lies to the south of that. Shazad is an, e Shazad is an evil sorcerer, um, and he is kind of like a big old boss fight. Um, uh, the Corsair Coast is the coastline here. Um, it's actually patrolled by bands of raiding gnolls who ride on these ships that are stitched together from the wreckages of old, like, thank you, Lucy, um, of old, um, kingdom ships. So, uh, really cool idea. I just think in this world, or at least in the Far Lands, a gnoll pirate aesthetic makes sense, because the, what gnolls do, and also pirates do, kind of fletches out and like you could have like them being old sea dogs and they have salty patchy fur and and hats and whatever so that'll be fun um down here we have the brine briar bog 
and I'm a sucker for alliteration. The Brian Byer Briar Bog um, is kind of like a uh, the place where the salt water meets the fresh water, and uh, it's just a nasty swamp. Haven't figured out what's going to be down there. Probably witches, uh, hags, or whatever. These are grasslands, uh, mostly identified as the Ogre Hills due to large uh, clans of ogres that war with one another. Uh, maybe, like, the players could, like, align themselves with one and try and, like, win a battle or something. Um, but I haven't, you know, fleshed that out quite yet either. Um, we then have the Big Empty and the Dragon Wastes. The Big Empty is a vast prairie, just, like, tall grasslands, uh, uh, or, you know, tall prairie grass, scrub, um, and just, like, no trees for miles and miles and miles. The Big Empty is really hard to survive in. You have to, like, you know, uh, collect, um, your, like, horse or, um, mount droppings to use for fire, fuel, and everything like that. Um, so oftentimes, you know, people will, like, journey into the Big Empty and die. Um, but it can be done to return, and a lot of traders return to be clubbed in with tales from the Big Empty. We also have, have up here the Great Wood. This is like a alpine forest, so like evergreen trees. Um, haven't come up with a quest there uh, for there yet. Um, and then Castle Krakenguard was actually um, manned a long time ago, but in the, when the old kingdom, like you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, had this whole land conquered. Um, and it's just a vestige of that old civilization, um, and it is now a crumbling kind of ruins, but deep in the dungeon below, um, where the, because it's sitting on a lake, uh, where it's flooded, an abolith has taken hold, and its tendrils, its tentacles go all throughout the castle, and, uh, its minions, of course, it's mind-controlled, um, patrol and guard the castle. So I think that'll be a cool idea for a quest, and, and that'll be fun. Um, the Dragon Wastes are uh, from the Dragon Wars that happened millions, not millions, <laughs> thousands of years ago. Um, just completely desolate. Nothing but, like, sulfur, um, sand, and dirt um, exists there. And dragons, though. Dragons do make their roosts in this area, so if you're going dragon hunting, that's the place to start. Um... And that is uh, about what I've come up with. Oh, the Lonely Lake. Also, there's a quest um, um, about a uh, weird eldritch horror creature that lives at the bottom of the lake um, that the townsfolk have to uh, sacrifice a person to every year. Um, and they cover it up, saying that the people mysteriously drowned or whatever. And the adventurers, when they go to the Beflubton, set it so that exactly, like, when they get there is exactly like three or four days after the last person went missing. And so they're still like, like the family members of that person didn't know what's up because only some members of the town know what's up. Um, and so it's like a mystery they have to solve. And uh, basically the they have this weird cult surrounding it where um, when the original settlers of Bufflupton moved in, they would drink the water of the lake and it was... Uh, it was not potable, and they would all, you know, get sick. Um, and they would try to eat the fish, but it would, like, they would catch no fish, and there was no game to be caught, and nothing would grow. Um, but once uh, a girl of the village drowned in the lake, um, they found that it was, like, super plentiful. And um, they realized that they could, like, sacrifice people um, to this weird eldritch horror creature who like comes up out of the water and it's like a tentacle with an eye on it that's all that they see and then the person but basically what they do is they tie a person to a raft float it out into the middle of the lake the weird creature comes up like latches on around the person just brings them under and then they have great crops and they get great game and the water's now potable and the fishing is great and so they're like hey you know i mean one person for all of us to live um, maybe, you know, it's something we just have to do. So, they've built a secret kind of cult society around this. Um, they're like the protectors of the Flubton. By the way, if you feel that the Flubton is too silly of a name, you feel free to change it. I just thought it was a funny name because I was just spitballing. And I was like, the Flubton, and it sounds like a fantasy name. 
Um, so that's what I've been working on. Uh, some D&D homebrew stuff. Um, I was kind of tinkering around with what all the races got. Um, and I kind of changed it up because I wanted a lower power level. And I was... Uh, and I was also very tired of everyone having dark vision. I just, I don't like that. I like the idea of, like, light source being a challenge and a constant worry. And it's just too easy in 5th edition by the book where everyone in the party has dark vision. And they're all like, ah, we, we don't care about lights. And I'm like, okay. Um, so this is what I did. I also made um, little random rolls for height and weight. Um, so I can run through these. Uh, but uh, uh, dwarves are the... Only ones with dark vision, because that's the only ones that, like, it really made sense, because they live underground, uh, to me. Everyone else, uh, like, the elves still get keen senses, and, like, fey ancestry, and everything like that, um, but they just don't get dark vision. Maybe, uh, drow, if you're relying on them, though. Obviously, that, that would make sense. Um, for heights and weights, uh, so, um, uh, dwarves, um, I have the height at 47 plus 1d12 inches, um, and weight at their strength times 10 plus 50 pounds. So that's minimum weight, uh, meaning like a person of this size at their lowest weight possible would be this much. Uh, so for example, like it really highlights how much halflings, how small they are, because a lot of people don't really recognize that. And this is going by the recommended like average heights given by the PHB, and I just came up with a die roll that recreated that. Um, so for the height of a hobbit, uh, halfling, uh, is 20 plus 46 inches. So that is, um, a range of two feet to, um, four feet tall, with the average being three feet. Um, and the stre uh, weight minimum is being s their strength score times two plus 20. So an average strength of 10, let's say, would be... 20 plus 20, so 40 pounds is 3 foot. I mean, that's like, that's that's a halfling. And, like, think that's small. So, you know, just, like, keep that in mind whenever you're role-playing your halflings because they are a lot smaller than we tend to think. And that's why I, I also took out gnomes. I feel like halflings and gnomes share a lot of the same stuff, and, and this is a custom world anyway. So in this world, there's only uh, halflings. As a, there are dwarves, uh, but dwarves are kind of, like, very close cousins to halflings that just also are a little bit bigger and live underground. Whereas halflings live in little hobbit holes, but not quite like mines. Um, oh, and another big change, I, I, the problem of half-orcs. Half-orcs, um, come out of a, a wish to say like, oh, what if there's like a monstrous race, but they're only half monstrous. And it's the same thing with like a tiefling of like, oh, I'm partially evil, but now I'm on the good guy team and ooh, edgy. Um, I don't like the like, uh, you what you have to confront with half orcs as either, okay, do, were your parents like um, a human and orc like couple and then they were just, like, looked down upon because orcs in the setting are very violent and there's a war between them and whatever. I mean, that could be cool, but, like, how common would that be? Um, and in normal D&D lore, I believe it's Grumsh wants revenge against the other gods, so he's blessed orcs with being very fertile and they can have babies with anyone or something. Um, either way, I just took out half-orc and just replaced it with orc. So it's like Oblivion or Skyrim or the Elder Scrolls series where orcs are just another race... Um, but in, uh, in Gree, they've been banished to the Far Lands. Um, but, of course, in the Far Lands, it's kind of like law, you know, like, people would rather just have a sturdy soldier by their side who has their back, and they don't really much care if it's an orc or an elf. Um, so, player characters can be orcs. Uh, that being said, it's the same stats as a half-orc. I just call it an orc. All said and done. If you want, you can use the orc rules from Volo's Guide, of course. Um, one final... Um, uh, well, I guess I'll touch on Dragonborn. Um, uh, uh, if you want, just so you don't have to do the math itself, I can say all the height and weight uh, for everyone. So, uh, Wood Elf... Um, Height's going to be 48 plus 2d12 inches. Weight's going to be strength times 5 plus 70 pounds. 
uh, high elf 50 plus 1d12, strength times 5 plus 7d. Um, humans just 60 plus 3d6 inches, uh, strength times 10 plus 50 pounds. Um, half elf 60 plus 3d4 inches, strength times 10 plus 40 pounds. Um, orc 56 plus 3d6 inches, strength times 10 plus 75 pounds minimum, and uh, Dragonborn 72 plus 3d6 inches, um, strength times 10 plus 100 pounds minimum. So Dragonborns are really big. Uh, what I was going to touch on with Dragonborn is um, the Dragon Wars in this setting were a big deal. Uh, consequently, the Dragon Wastes, of course, are like an old battleground. Um, so the Dragonborn clans are still very much uh, have tension with one another. Um, so if I have a player playing that, I'm going to like highlight that and say, okay, what clan are you with? Uh, you know, like, how intensely are you involved in these clan conflicts, or do you try, are you, like, the exception and you, like, haven't really cared about it? Um, the big difference in Gree, I was playing around with the idea of, and I think I'm gonna go ahead and do it, um, even, my, the player's level one, so it doesn't really matter at this point, but, um, dragons, there are only one, there's only one dragon for each color. Um, or metallic is a color, you're right? So basically there's not red dragons and blue dragons. And it's like red dragons tend to be this. It is, there is only and has ever been one red dragon. And he is, or she is, like this. And so that's why red dragons are associated with that. And same thing with all the other dragons, right? And so the dragon wars were like, that you could pick one or two dragon breeds that were like permanently wiped out because that dragon was killed. Because in this setting, dragons are super powerful. I want to give them full spell casting ability, full everything. They're all ancient, right? There's no like young baby dragons. It's just like they're gods essentially, right? They're they're god tier power level. Um. Boom. What else can I talk about? Okay, so calendar. Uh, I just went ahead and did a separate calendar for Gree. Um, one age is 100 years. Uh, one year itself is actually 360 days. Makes it nice and even so that each month is 30 days. And months aren't divided into weeks. Rather, they're divided into three rides, R-I-D-E. Um, each ride uh, is a 10-day period. Uh, so... Um, I think in Forgotten Realms they have 10 days, I forget, but basically it's like the first ride of the month, the second ride, and the third ride. Um, then uh, there are 12 months, but they're, they go by um, like a sigil. So uh, spring, starting with, mm, here's, let's see if I can't bring that. Uh, starting with spring, it is uh, the flower, then the toad, then the mare. So that would be uh, April, May, June, no, oh, wait, no, uh, sorry, March, April, May, uh, so starting with June would be the finch, then the dragon, then the ox, the fox, the serpent, the owl, the wolf, the hare, and the raven, um, the, so those are the months of the names, so we would say, oh, it was the 21st of the raven, or something like that, um, would be how you describe the date, I think keeping track of dates is important in D&D because you want to know how your character age. I think everyone should know their character's birthday because then when they're after five, six, seven sessions, maybe there's been time in between adventures. Um, just everyone's starting to feel comfortable with each other's characters and they might say like, it might be like, oh, by the way, this character has a birthday. So then this adventure is, set, is like based around them trying to go and get that character a birthday present. Especially if that person, that player cannot be there that night it's a great be like, well, their character's birthday is coming up. We should go on an adventure to get them a cool present. That's fun, you know. Calendars are important. Um, okay. I will touch on the religion in Gree. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk about... Um, I guess that's fine. Um, bum, bum, bum. yeah, uh, I'll just go ahead and jump on into religion. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, religion and the known gods. There are, uh, uh, multitude, there, there can be more than just these number of gods. They just might not have made themselves known to 
uh, mortals at this moment. All of the gods on this list are known and have spoken to mortals at one point to where that mortal has transcribed and become a prophet of that, you know, god or whatever. Um, so these are taken from 4th edition D&D, which I feel has some very underrated gods, but a lot of them are classic gods from D&D itself. So uh, I have 12, uh, starting with Arathis. Arathis is the author of law, the founder of cities, and the goddess of civilization. Common to see some sort of sigil or statue honoring her in every settlement. Uh, she rarely appears on the world itself, but in the most dire of circumstances. So you're kind of a deus ex machina thing you could do with Arathis. Uh, her tenets are build, expand, and conquer. Community and order must be upheld. Paylor, classic Paylor, bringing, the bringer of the bountiful harvest, the keeper of time, and the god of kindness. Paylor is the most widely worshipped god, and his symbol is commonly worn on necklaces. Paylor is said to almost never appear to large crowds, but instead to uh, sole individuals in their time of greatest need. So he might appear as a wanderer, as a shepherd, as something unthreatening and uh, nice and provides the kindness, you know, like a kind stranger. His tenets are show mercy or show kindness, mercy, and compassion. Bring help to those in need. Ayun, the keeper of magics, the foreteller of prophecies, and the goddess of knowledge. Another classic D&D goddess. Uh, the favored goddess of scholars and mages everywhere. She hasn't been, uh, there hasn't been a recorded sighting of her um, since way ancient times. Um, but it is assumed that she's in study in her, like, astral library somewhere in the multiverse. Um, her tenets are forgo emotion and bias instead for reason and logic, and accumulate, preserve, and distribute knowledge. That third part of that is also pretty important. Um, uh, like, it's not the accu accumulation and, uh, collecting and hoarding of knowledge and keeping for yourself, like Shazad the sorcerer would, would do. It is, you get that knowledge, you must spread it, and you teach people and uh, encourage learning. Corellon, the father of magic, the patron of the fae, and the god of beauty. Especially revered by high elves, uh, he, his appearances are sporadic and for seemingly random reasons. Uh, he is the eldest of the known gods, and he planted the seed of magic in the world, in the first forest. Um, his tenets are strive for artistic beauty in all that you do. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you, uh, build houses and you strive for, to make beautiful houses, or if you are a hired killer, like a hitman mercenary, and you strive to make beautiful, you know, killing shots and be, like, the master of your craft, right? Speaking of craft, Moradin, the solver of puzzles, the smith of the god forge, and the god of invention. Highly favored among dwarven clans, he's known to appear to those who create the most excellent of items. So if you have a master artificer who creates this awesome invention at a 15th, 16th level, Moradin might appear to them. Uh, respect your, his tenets. Respect your tools, your materials, and your craft. It is your duty when a problem arises to solve it. Melora, the sentinel of the seas and the goddess of the ocean. Known for her duality, Melora is both the peaceful water and the raging tempest. She's not too popular with um, citizens, save for fishermen and sailors, um, but the majority of her worshippers are actually Kuatoa and other fish folk. Uh, marrow and mermaids, stuff like that. Um, her chants are foster respect for the sea and its creatures uh, and to protect nature in the wild. Her brother is a god I completely made up, but I wanted to. Uh, his name is Phaeon, F-A-E-O-N. He's the warden of the green and the god of uh, nature. Uh, said to constantly wander the deep wood as a massive beast. Um, uh, so he is actually on the mortal realm a lot. Uh, he's brother of Melora, uh, as well as a rival. His tents are protect nature from corruption. Life and death are all parts of nature, the cyclical nature of energy, right? Um, uh, we have Avandra, the Traveler, the Chain Breaker, uh, and the goddess of uh, travel and freedom. Avandra is favored amongst adventurers. Few temples are found in civilized lands, but her wayside shrines appear throughout the world. Tenets, of course, are be free and help others to be free. Kord, the lord of war and the god of battle. His sigil is a fist 
gripping a sword. Um, win glory by proving your combat prowess, be brave and scorn cowardice are his tenets. He's known to appear in large battles, he can't help himself sometimes. Uh, when you get a big enough battle, he'll just like appear and start killing people. Uh, he's held sacred by warriors, soldiers, and athletes as well. Rarely has temples as his practic practitioners see the battlefield or the playing field as their temple. The Raven Queen, classic D&D goddess, the spinner of fate, the ender of suffering, the goddess of death. Her true name is long since been forgotten, um, but she is forever pledged against the forces of undeath. Her tenets are punish hubris, as all are equal in the ground, or in, the, in death, once you're put into the ground, uh, to stamp out the forces of undeath, as they are unnatural. Uh, her, her eternal enemy is, of course, going to be the demon lord Orcus. Uh, Siphonine, the goddess of tricksters and liars. She is the sister of Corellon, frequents our world to amuse herself by tricking mortals, so she'd be a good random encounter for when you roll double O or roll 99, something like that. Uh, her tenets revealing, there's not really too many tenets revealed because her, her wishes are a mystery. And now we get to the three distinctly evil goddess, we have, uh, or gods, we have Lolth, uh, the ruler of darkness, the queen of spiders, and the goddess of evil. She's revered by the dark elves of the Underdark, uh, of course, and uh, her tenets are to spread suffering to all and to take merciless vengeance on those who have wronged you. A very drow thing to do. Uh, Torog, I believe a god who is exclusively featured in 4th edition, very underrated. He is the king that crawls, the patron of dungeons, and the god of imprisonment and torture. He appears in dungeons and attempts to trap adventurers and torture them for all of eternity. Suspicions state that speaking his name, merely speaking his name, thrice uh, into a mirror invites him to haunt and torment you for the rest of your days. His tenets are but one. Torture. Torture everyone. <laughs> he's a, you know, dominate torture. He's, he's a... Uh, Creepy, creepy god. I also imagine him as like a big worm god because he it just calls him the king that crawls. I think that maybe like a centipede. Really creepy, awesome uh, final boss for high level adventurers, I feel. Um, but he's also looked down upon by the other gods because he's very weak compared to them, which is probably why he just spends his time like picking on mortals. And finally, Thursden, uh, the father of the abyss, the chained one, the god of the Great Ending, also called the Elder Elemental Eye. His name is known to few save the most devout of cultists. He is uh, chained, imprisoned by, uh, you know, chains forged by Moradin himself. Um, and if he were to be released, it would surely mean the end of days. So he's your typical Cthulian, Lovecraftian, apocalyptic god. Um, Another great, if I'm running cultists, they're going to be cultists of Tharuzdan. Although they won't speak his name, uh, because it's, like, sacred and, you know, they have to keep it quiet. So they'll, they'll call him the, the Eye, the Father of the Abyss. They'll call him the Chained One. Stuff like that. Oh, well, thank you for letting me ramble. That's just at 30 minutes. Um, I appreciate. Uh, I will be posting a lot more D&D-related content. Perhaps some Magic the Gathering-related content as well. Um, but I'll keep you updated, um, and I'll, um, talk about the adventures in The Far Land.